with illegal mining, you get illegal guns, you get the prostitution, you get the drugs, you get everything. Illegality breeds illegality. Lawful activity, lawful mining breeds lawful activity. It's as simple as that. We all know that. Well, we know it. The government doesn't seem to realize it. The future of mining in South Africa is highly uncertain. How do we create an enabling environment for this critical sector to flourish? Well, joining me to discuss is Hume Scholes. He is an attorney with an emphasis on mining law. He is with Malan Scholes Attorneys. Hume Scholes, welcome to the show. Let's first start off with the legal and regulatory framework. The MPRDA is the principal legislation governing mining in South Africa. How enabling is it of the sector? Yeah, so David, as you correctly point out, we have the, the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act 2002, and we have the Mining Charter, Mining Charter 3, which is read in, in, in conjunction with that, which specifically deals with the transformation imperatives in the MPRD Act. Um, the MPRD Act came into effect on 1 May 2004, and it very radically changed the pattern of... Um, mineral right or mineral title ownership in South Africa. Basically what it did was it destroyed the concept of the common law or private ownership of mineral rights and replaced it with a system whereby the state um, um, grants mining rights and prospecting rights to, to prospective applicants. And uh, the MPRD Act um, introduced the, for the first time in South Africa, from that date, being 1 May 2004, the concept of the requirement for BEE in the mining industry. And what's quite interesting about the MPRD Act is that the requirement for, for BEE or Black Economic Empowerment was absolute. Um, you would not be able to continue to operate or apply for a conversion of your old rights or apply for new rights if you did not have a BEE component. That's in a nutshell how it all works. All right. And so I had a discussion with Paul Miller, who is a mining finance expert. And he said that one of yeah. the key uh, premises of this new regulation was that this concept of use it or lose it. And I argued that you know it's important for companies to uh, have control over the mineral rights beneath the, the soil, uh, whereas the current framework kind of really only gives you rights uh, above uh, on the topsoil, so to speak. Um, and, you know, he said that actually this was important for uh, releasing the grip that the incumbent mines had and for crowding in uh, new new developments, uh, uh, encouraging prospecting and, and new projects. So, I mean, do you think that that's an accurate assessment? So, um, basically, the, the, the term use it or lose it um, was changed. Um, you won't find it in any in in any legislation or regulation, but um, it was a bit scary to investors. So the term was rather changed to use it and keep it, which which sounds a little bit less of a Zimbabwean land grab than use it or lose it. Now that principle, if you have to translate that into the regulatory framework introduced by the NPRD Act meant that if you follow the conversion process in the Act, you could hang on to your old order rights and you could continue to operate in circumstances where you timelessly apply for a conversion of those rights to the new form of mining right introduced by the NPRD Act and a critical component of that right to convert and to continue is compliance with a BEE um, component, which was regulated by the mining charter, which demonstrated, or was the guideline rather, that you had to comply with, with respect to BEE in order to successfully convert your rights. And then you, you touched on an interesting um, um, topic, um, David. You asked an interesting question without even knowing that you're asking it. That's how good you are. Um, the, the, the topic or the rather legal 
principle of whether this act amounted to an expropriation of rights was dealt with in the constitutional court, the agri SA judgment, where the, 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 the court, the constitutional court held in a nutshell that the MPOD Act did not or does not amount to an expropriation of rights. And for that reason, the state um, um, does not need to pay compensation to people who had old rights under the old system. My personal view is that from a principle, it was a correct outcome um, because the state could not or would not be able to claim the millions and millions and millions of rands worth of claims which would arise if it was held to be an expropriation. You're subject to regulatory compliance, obviously. Um, but the I'm not going to bore you too much detail, but I think the, the reasoning in the judgment was flawed, but it, it, it in principle came to the right uh, conclusion that it's not the MPRA Act does not amount to a an expropriation. Okay, well, that's interesting. I mean, I think uh, if we look around, we see commodity prices are really high at the moment. Uh, that's produced enormous windfall of revenues for these mining companies and yes. for the states as well, who are who are paying for uh, you know the the taxes that that fund the state's activities. Uh, the the fiscal deficit has been reduced somewhat, um, but you know that commodity cycle is not going to last forever. We're starting to maybe see prices. Uh, starting to uh, to come down, aluminium, tin, uh, global commodity prices maybe are, are set to decline a bit. So, uh, you know, this windfall is not going to last, and no. and we have these legacy mines uh, that are nearing the end of their life, and no real new prospecting for for new mines. Uh, do you think that the mining industry is in danger here of? Of, of shrinking, if not collapsing? Definitely of shrinking, and it shouldn't. Um, collapsing, I think, um, no, not for the near future, but we could definitely be doing better. And to explain my statement, the MPRD Act is a very cleverly thought out piece of legislation to give effect to constitutional transformation imperatives. What, however, where it went wrong, David, was if you look at when the MPRD Act came into, into effect, it was 1 May 2004, as I said. I, at the time, was involved in mining mergers and acquisitions, and I was at Worksman's, I was a director at Worksman's at the time, and we lurched from mining deal to, to mining deal to mining deal to mining deal. There were two reasons for that. All this activity was obviously buoyed by commodity prices at the time, but importantly, contributing to that deal flow and that energy um, for mining in South Africa and the investment was the fact that the state officials in charge of mining, like the DG, DDG, the minister at the time, they took administrative decisions. As South Africa, progressed along the road of state capture, corruption. We all know the story, but decision-making became political and no longer administrative. And that's where we went wrong. And that's where we could have done better. And that is why we are dealing with the consequences of a shrinking mining injury, um, uh, sorry, uh, industry, Freudian slippery mining injury, as opposed to mining industry today. It's because of maladministration corruption, and the state's inability to manage the industry. That's why we're sitting where we are. If we had continued on the trajectory of administrative, objective decision-making and application of the law in the absence of corruption, we wouldn't be where we are now. In a nutshell, that's the answer. And that theme or proposition that I've just explained applies across the board in this country. It's not just to mining. I mean, we all know this. Imagine where we would be, have been if we did not have the Zuma years. If we did in the mining industry not have Zwani, who was a Gupta plant as our minister, um, we would have been in a much, much better space. South Africa has got still a lot of mining potential and room for expansion. 
But the reason why we are in a shrinking industry is simply because of the state's inability to create an investor friendly environment. It is as simple as that. It is not more complicated than that. Yeah, look, I think one of the problems is that you grant ministers this incredible discretionary power to adjudicate over uh, prospecting rights. And, you know, as Paul Miller pointed out, uh, Section 171A says that when you are applying for a prospecting license, you need to demonstrate that you have the technical capabilities, you have the know how um, and the resources to do so. But meanwhile, the minister has basically uh, in the past decided on a whim to give it to politically connected entities. And then these these groups maybe just sit on the on the land and don't actually uh, do any investment or or, or or sink any capital into those projects. So, uh, you know, I so, think so, yeah. Go ahead, da David. Sorry to interrupt you. But let me just correct something. And it's 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 so what you say is correct, but it's the wrong reasoning, and I'll explain. People often say there's too much discretion in this act. And there isn't actually. The act makes it very, very clear that when you apply for a prospecting right and you can tick the boxes, you must get the right. If you apply for a mining right and you can tick the boxes, you must get the right. The act actually uses the word must. There's very little ministerial discretion in the MPRD Act when it comes to the decision to grant prospecting rights and mining rights. You, if you can tick the boxes in the application process, the minister must, I'm quoting from the act, grant the right applied for. Where the corruption comes in is if there are officials in the department, which they are, which are corrupt, they will then at the right time to make it administratively, administratively difficult for you, introduce a fraudulent comp a fraudulent competing application into the system, which you then have to deal with by way of an appeal and all of that. And we have seen much of this, a lot of this in the DMRE. And then people eventually just get worn down by the process and the appeals and the cross appeals and having to deal with that. You get like corrupt officials telling um, um, businessmen outside of the department who they have a relationship with, put in an application over company X's mining area, for example, their right will be lapsing soon, or they have this sort of issue, or they have that sort of issue. Then you have to deal with that by way of an administrative process, which is time consuming, expensive, and cumbersome. And that is where the issue lies. The corruption does not manifest in the minister's discretion, which is not prevalent in the act, the corruption manifests in the processing system to get to the decision to grant or refuse the right. That's where it's prevalent. Right. Well, Hume, one of the features of contemporary mining in South Africa is the explosion of illegal mining of Zama Zamas. What do you think is driving that? And, you know, is this a big problem? Uh, and how do you see the government reacting to this phenomenon? So it's just the, the illegal mining is, you know, criminals expand anyway into a vacuum created by the police. So the lack of effective policing in South Africa means there's a criminal opportunity. So because that there's no policing, criminals realized that mining illegally is lucrative and the authorities will do nothing about it so let's mine illegally. That's the simple cause of it. And the state's reaction to it, in the absence of there being proper policing of it, is to deal with the issue by just trying to introduce another layer of legislation into an already overburdened system by gazetting the artisanal mining policy, for example where by a stroke of the pen, they try and inherently legitimize an illegal activity. <clears throat> I always use the analogy, the artisanal mining policy is like saying to a drug dealer, 
selling heroin on the street corner. If you hand yourself in one, two, you go to Vits and get a B pharmacy degree, and three, you start paying taxi, taxes and royalties on the heroin you're selling, you can continue to operate. It's just a fantasy. It's not going to happen. Inherently illegal activity does not get legitimized in the absence of policing it to start. The only way we can ever in this country pursue a proper system of artisanal or small scale mining is if the rank criminality in the mining industry gets curbed. And that will only happen by effective policing and effective prosecution. It's, it's syndicated criminality, David. The minerals mined by these zamazamas are exported and processed and sold by criminal syndicates. You've got to stop that criminal syndicated criminality before you can deal with the issue. An artisanal mining policy is not going to fix the issue. Most definitely not. And I saw you commenting somewhere that illegal mining constitutes about 30% of gold exports in South Africa. So the, there's the Minerals Council. Huge... Yeah. No, it's massive. I mean, the, the, the loss to the fiscus is billions of rands. You see what people don't realize, David, and it's logical, but I'm, but I'm talking from experience. If you make it really difficult to mine lawfully, people will mine unlawfully. Everything of value is going to be mined. It's going to be mined illegally or it's going to be mined legally. So make the system user-friendly so that legal mining can happen. Regulate the system to make it easy so people can apply for prospecting rights and mining rights and lawful activity um, um, follows. If you make it too hard for lawful activity to follow, illegal or unlawful activity follows. That's what we're dealing with as well. The system is too clumsy and it is not well managed. So it's easier to mine illegally than to mine legally. That's what yeah, we're dealing with. I think the irony there is that the state tries to control the whole process, maladministers the industry, and then that actually creates all of this chaos on the margins where now you have these criminal groups operating. Correct. Correct. And as I said, and it's logical, the failure of the police to intervene when there's this unlawful activity makes it lucrative for criminals. Criminals will do what uh, they, they will. They will. They will undertake any criminal activity that makes them money, in a system where the police do not do nothing about it. It's not just in mining; it's everywhere. And that, I mean, that's just logical. Yeah, I once met with a researcher, and he told me some pretty horrific stories about uh, desperate migrants coming over from Lesotho, and actually almost being abducted uh, by some of these criminal groups, forced to live underground for weeks at a time, often dying. It's terrible. Uh, under terrible, it's terrible circumstances. Um, Look, and... that, 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 that human tragedy at the end of the illegal mining business, if I can call it that, they are exploited like people at the, at the bottom end of any criminal um, system. That poor guy from Lesotho or Mozambique who has been retrenched um, from a lawful gold mining operation, he's desperate. He goes underground for 70 or 80 rand a day and dies there. Um, he's not the problem. He's a victim of the syndicated criminal activity. Stop the syndicated criminal activity by effective policing and you will deal with the problem. Until then, we're, getting, we're not going to win this war. With illegal mining, you get illegal guns, you get the prostitution, you get the drugs. You get everything. Illegality breeds illegality. Lawful activity, lawful mining breeds lawful activity. It's as simple as that. We all know that. Well, we know it. The government doesn't seem to realize it. So, Hume, what I'd like to ask is just about the role of the Minerals Council, the former Chamber of Mines. And, you know, that has typically represented the interests of established mines um, and perhaps at the expense of encouraging more competition in the mining sector, uh, regulation that is... Uh, more uh, liberalizing and, and creating uh, more opportunities for new entrants into the sector. Do you think that that's an unfair criticism? Uh, what role should the Minerals Council be playing in 
advocating for a more sustainable future for mining? They do obviously promote the interests of their members which are the, um, um, you know, the larger mining companies, but anybody is, is, is free to join the Minerals Council. Um, and they do really, really good work. And uh, Roger Baxter, who's the chairperson of the, the, the Minerals Council, is a very clever and very um, um, sort of energized person to, to try and achieve the right things for the Minerals Council. My personal criticism of them was that historically they did not take a hard enough stand against the state. Um, that when the cracks, cracks started to show, when corruption started to creep in, they should have been uh, uh, more aggressive by bringing more court applications, by forcing the government to do by way of a court process what they should be doing. That attitude changed. And I think the catalyst for that was the disastrous tenure of Zwane as the uh, um, Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy. We all know um, um, from the Zondo Commission report, his involvement and the fact that he was just a criminal placed there by the Guptas. Um, since then, the Minerals Council, I believe, realized they've got to take a harder view. This culminated in their challenge to Mining Charter 3, um, um, which struck out many of the unworkable and ridiculous um, provisions of Mining Charter 3. And in fact, the court application they brought to confirm that there is the so-called once, once empowered, always empowered principle inherent in the charter, the Mining Charter. So in a nutshell, I think the criticism that they do not do enough for the mining industry generally is not really warranted in the current climate. Um, they are doing their best, but obviously they are often constrained by what their members want them to do as an association. It's an association of members who have sort of vested interests, but as a general proposition, they're doing the right thing. They've got some very clever people there and, and they, they, we need them. We definitely need them in the system. Okay, but the lesson from the Zwani experience, and I thought it was very good that they said, we can no longer engage in good faith with this minister. This was during the Zuma years. Um, Correct. And, and you know, I think that, that was a very important way for the sector to push back and to exercise its power. But Correct. My, my reading, I'm not an industry expert, but I kind of see them almost reverting back to this consensus model. But then we have someone like Neil Froneman uh, of Sabanya Stillwater, who's saying, well, actually, no, we need more of a transactional approach. We need to be equal partners negotiating with government, and government needs to recognize the, the mining sector's very important role. And we mentioned all the revenues that the state gets from the sector. So my personal view is that we should be much more transactional in our approach with government when we talk about business-government relations. But, okay, no, what, what, what do you think? I, I, I agree, I agree with you, David. Um, um, and the the sort of migration from uh, a, a a more amicable amicable approach to a more transactional approach and and more confrontational approach with the state did come from the Zwane area, the the Zwane Zwane era. Um, I think that people were so relieved. Uh, just to get rid of Zwani and see him replaced by Mantashe, that we sort of went over, we transitioned to a more amicable approach. But that is now also proving to not have the results that we were hoping for. And I see us going back to a more transactional approach. The, the Minerals Council itself um, also hardened its stance um, and the charter litigation was actually brought during the tenure of um, Mantashe. I just think in this country, in all sectors, we've realized, David, and the, the mining sectors realized that the ANC is a party that cannot be trusted. It's a party that is just so riddled with bad eggs and corrupt people that there's no hope 
of the ANC, I believe, of doing anything which is going to resolve South Africa's issues. And there's no, there's no hope in negotiating or trying to have an amicable relationship with an ANC-controlled government, we pass that. And the only way to deal with them is through transactional, um, um, a transactional attitude, as Neil Froneman has called it. I mean, how do you negotiate with somebody who's corrupt and self-serving? There's no common ground. You can, only, you can only negotiate with a person where somewhere there's going to be a common denominator. The ANC is in survival mode, and I think it's stealing as much as it can before it gets ousted. You're not going to deal with anybody. On, you're not going to have an amicable relationship with, in, in, with a political party who has the grip on government who is in that phase of its failure. There's no point. So could you give an example of how this transactional mode might look like? Uh, what would be, say, a typical scenario where the government would want to extract some concessions or some rents from the sector and the sector could push back? Applying the law, applying your constitutional rights to administrative review, compelling the government to do what it has to do. We've got a sophisticated constitution. We've got a sophisticated promotion of Administrative Justice Act. We've got a, a, a sophisticated court system and people are going to use it um, um, as, as the Minerals Council um, used it. You know, it's, 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 we don't want to be in a position in South Africa where applications for prospecting rights and mining rights end up in court. We want to be in a system where the government will administer, but we're not in that system. So we must force him to administer, unfortunately. That's where we're going. Yeah, power responds to power and it doesn't seem to recognize its institutional power. Correct. So Hume, I mean, you've done quite a bit of work outside of South Africa, and I think there might be some lessons from other African countries in particular, may not be as economically developed as South Africa, but maybe are approaching the, their mining and mineral endowment with a bit more uh, sensibility. Uh, could you reflect on some of your experiences in the rest of the continent and lessons we could learn uh, here in SA? So my, my very, very good and, 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 and very sort of hopeful experiences, I mean, hopeful for the continent, have the experiences I've recently had in Zambia with um, the new president and his team. Um, I'm part of an advisory to the president. I mean, David, it's like you are working in a completely, completely different country. There's political will to do the right thing. There's political will and energy to promote the country and, br and bring in investment. There's a realization that the only way you are going to grow is with foreign direct investment. And the only way you're gonna attract foreign direct investment is by way of creating a non-corrupt, user-friendly state. And that's what that president is doing. I mean, we saw at the mining in Darba, the announcement by First Quantum Minerals, that they're going to make a $1.5 billion investment in Zambia to grow their operations there. I mean, South Africa looked stupid at the mining in Darba. That announcement and the energy around it stole the show at the mining in Darba in our own backyard. And, and I'm afraid to say, to be quite frank about it, we don't have the political will in this country to grow the mining industry. Without political will, we're not going to grow because we're not user-friendly and investor-friendly. And until our government realizes that it is not our minerals and we can do with our minerals what we like, they must realize the minerals belong to the man who brings $1.5 billion and puts it into your country. Because what do you get out of it? You get royalty, you get taxes, you get growth, and more importantly, you get happy citizens. We haven't realized that yet. Our government has not realized that. We can't have resource nationalization in any country that wants to grow. 
we've got to get past that and we haven't. Yeah, and I think the recent history of Zambia is also quite instructive because in the 70s under Kenneth Kaunda, they nationalized the copper industry and- They lost know, that... 64 billion pounds on their own version. The consequence of nationalization of their, their, their industry cost 64 billion pounds. Yeah, they learned they, their lesson in the hard way. Yeah, and so they eventually, after bankrupting that industry, after it lost so much productivity and output, uh, they eventually had to go with the begging bowl. Uh, yeah. Correct, correct. And so I think what's quite lamentable about that is you think that you're asserting your sovereignty by saying, oh, we're capturing the true value of our minerals, but actually you end up losing your, your freedom and your decision-making to external actors. It's, it's uh, you, you can have, look, I'm sta I had the risk of stating the patently obvious. You don't have to be in the mining industry to realize this, that the mineral endowment under the ground is worth absolutely nothing if people are not going to come and spend Let's use the first quantum example of $1.5 billion to bring it out of the ground. Because the government doesn't have $1.5 billion in any country in Africa to do it. So foreigners must come. Make it easy for them to come. We're not yeah. there yet. And I think what's interesting is that South Africa is slipping down the, the indices of, of mining competitiveness. There's the Fraser Index. And I think we're now 75th out of... Uh, about 84, 85 <laughs> countries uh, that are ranked there. So we're kind of down at the bottom with the, the likes of Zimbabwe and Venezuela and so on. All right, so just getting back to this uh, work that you're doing in Zambia, you know, you working with President Ichilema, uh, what, what is the kind of approach that he's taking? What kind of work are you doing specifically? And are you being listened to? So the president, um, through the Brentist Foundation, has has um, called for assistance um, with, to, to, to coin a phrase, I'm not using any words of any Zambian government person, including the president, but to commercialize what they have. And there's a realization in Zambia that to commercialize what they have, they need assistance with skills and experience. And that is why he has called on myself to assist, to help them to commercialize what they have and for the Zambian government to extract as much value as it can from its mineral endowment. And that's why I'm there as part of an ad hoc mining advisory to assist the Zambian government and the president with their initiatives to make Zambia um, very investor and user friendly. And, and I can tell you, David, that if that president survives politically. Zambia is going to be Singapore. And I'm, I, I sound like I'm, I'm overreacting, but it's really, or over but he's really, really, really an incredibly intelligent and refreshing person to work with because he realizes what it takes to make a country work. And I actually had Greg Mills of the Brentos Foundation on the show as well, yes. uh, talking, talking about some of the opportunities in Africa and the importance of a democracy for economic development. Um, and that those two concepts really go hand in hand. And, you know, I think what's interesting there is, you know, you have political competition. Uh, Edgar Lungu, uh, who was the, his predecessor, uh, you know, was also a kind of very much focused on extracting patronage and rents and uh, benefiting his Corrupt, cronies. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that level of political competition is what also breeds better policy outcomes as well. No, definitely. And, and, we all know where we live. Um, I don't believe the ANC believes in democracy. They don't. I mean, if you believed in democracy, you would use the system and we wouldn't have, you know, babies dying in hospitals or we wouldn't have state of hospitals in complete disrepair. We wouldn't have a failed South African police services. Um, you know, if you believe in democracy, we wouldn't have that. If you believed in democracy, you would do the right thing to get investors in the country. The Zambian president and his government believe in democracy. So what you say is 100% correct. If you, if you have democracy that prevails and you respect the institution of democracy, what will follow is investment in your country. Because what investors look at 
one of the things they look at, even in mining, is how do you deal with your corrupt officials? How do you deal with them? Are there consequences for your corrupt officials? We still have people in this country in senior positions in government who are mentioned in the Zondo Commission report. Why would you put one rand or one dollar into a country where that system prevails? It's not going to happen. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is, you know, sometimes people, foreign commentators will look at, say, Rwanda and think, okay, well, here we have a country uh, that's almost like this bureaucratic authoritarian kind of system, and they're driving development. But actually, those systems tend to be quite weak, quite unsustainable, uh, very much reliant on uh, the strong man at the top, um, and that can very easily unravel. Correct. Um, look, I don't really know much about Rwanda, apart from the fact that they are they have a benevolent dictatorship. There's no such thing as a benevolent um, dictatorship. Yeah, no, 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 I know that's what the well, the media, the supporters of 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 the president there would call it a benevolent dictatorship. But I, I hear what you say. It's not, you're Ultimately, not, it's, it's not so benevolent for the enemies of the state. You end up dead in a hotel room in Santa. No, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. I agree with you completely. I was just sort of making the point in a very bumbling way that ultimately democracy must prevail for there to be growth. All right. Well, look, it's not a very positive story about the state of the mining sector in South Africa, but what can people who have an interest in this industry, who might be working in the industry or downstream, uh, what can they do in their individual capacity to, to try and preserve the incredible value that exists there and to see growth of the industry in the future? Is it being a bit more outspoken about uh, Go nefarious it alone. government policy? Go it alone. Create your own power, generate your own power. Unfortunately, have your own security. You, you've got to go it alone until the state um, comes right. And I believe the, the I mean, this is a discussion on, on uh, the mining industry, but I believe that we're going to be in that position until the ANC disappears and is replaced with something that is pro-democracy and that is pro the interest of the country. And until that time, we have to, the mining industry has to go it alone, as I said, generate its own power, have its own security, because you're not going to help get help from the state to do it. That is the reality. Yeah, I suppose going alone could also mean working with others uh, in a like-minded way, not necessarily working in isolation, per se. Correct. I mean, if you look at the, 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 the mining company, let's, let's look at uh, Pan-African resources they listed listed gold mining company but they've got operations in barberton they very recently um switched on their their big power their solar power um generating system to help them with 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 power other mining companies are doing the same of course our government is two or three years behind the power curve in allowing people to do that the regulatory environment to do that but there's still issues with that um, uh, uh, power generation. Um, my view is if you want to save South Africa, privatize everything. Privatize everything. Rest the economy out of the hands of the government and we'll make progress. So per our earlier discussion, do you think that business should be actively working against the government in that sense? So uh, being a bit more outspoken about perhaps supporting the opposition or working uh, you know, to, to draw much kind of harder, clearer lines uh, to say, you know, we cannot Correct. go beyond this point. You can't go beyond this point. And do, and, and do not allow the government to overstep the mark of governance and to, 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 to do sort of administrative overreach. Just stop them. Stop them legally and just refuse to cooperate in that circumstance. People have got to take a hard line with the government. We've got a failed state we're dealing with. The only way we're going to fix that mess is if we are harder with the government who's letting us down every single day. Yeah, and I think for valid reasons, business has often been a bit coy to engage in politics because they, they say, well, the business of business is business and we just don't want to get involved. But actually what we've seen over the last 10 years or so is well, you know, if you're naive about politics, that ends up actually infiltrating 
uh, your commercial interests, strangling uh, your ability to, to actually do business. I think business people should be thinking more about, well, which constituency do they serve? Whose interests do they serve? We talk a lot about business leaders, but leaders are prepared to make tough calls, hard decisions, and to stand up for the people that they represent. Uh, it's not just a popularity contest. Uh, it's actually about making those difficult decisions. Um, and sometimes that means you know, engaging in fights. Correct. You know, David, if you want to fix South Africa, <clears throat> if you told me you've got one, one thing to say to me to fix South Africa, not a whole thesis or a whole plan, just one thing. And it's simple. And that's the mining industry in South Africa. Fix the South African Police Services and National Prosecuting Authority. Fix it. Make, create an environment where there are consequences for criminals, where there are consequences for corrupt officials in the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, where people get go to jail. I mean, if you look, use an example, Malusi Kigaba, who's still walking around in his expensive suits. I mean, if you listen to the Zondo Commission or you read some of those reports on him, his former wife states under oath how she was with him when he got paid bribes, how she was with him when he got calls from the Guptas, how the Guptas put him under pressure. Surely by now, he should be in jail. If the system worked, he should be in jail. It's a good example. Fix yeah, that system and yeah. everything will follow. I think a lot of people focus on the Zondo Commission. I think it did some important work. Um, but what I've noticed in South Africa is we have quite a high degree of transparency in the media. Everybody knows all of the, uh, the dirty laundry is there to, to be seen uh, fluttering in the wind. Uh, but there's very little accountability. And, you know, I think that that's the other side of the equation is you actually need people in, in orange overalls for you to be saying, well, Correct. there is the accountability. And what you need to do, and I'm talking from, from, from personal experience. The, the, the NPA is completely understaffed with ex inexperienced people. I mean, we've had, I can think offhand of at least two cases, criminal cases, where they have been nothing short of completely hopeless and unable to prosecute. And we've had the matter struck off the roll. That needs to be fixed. Staff the NPA with trained, competent people. And the, 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 the mess that the NPA, look, I, I do believe it's improving. There is an effort to improve it. But the mess, was, the mess was engineered. In the Zuma era, it was engineered so that politically connected corrupt people would not be prosecuted. And that's what we're dealing with. We need to fix that. And everything will follow. If people get effectively prosecuted for illegal mining, there won't be illegal mining, but they don't. Jim Scholes, I wanted to thank you very much for what was a conversation about mining, but also so much more. And I think you've given us a lot to think about. So thanks very much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this conversation and you're watching on YouTube, please do give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Also leave your thoughts down in the comments section below. Do you think there is a sustainable future for mining in South Africa? If you're listening on your preferred podcast platform, please do subscribe there as well and also share it with your friends and family who may find it interesting. My name is David Ansara. This is the Solutions Podcast. Until next time, take care.